Hello, welcome to uh, Revelator Alpha here on the YouTube thing. Uh, uh, I'm for another uh, big show of Oh My Harley, but this is a special one. This is called Oh My Custom. And uh, guess what? I'm here with a very special guest. I cannot believe it. I cannot believe it. Can we have applause, <laughs> dancing girls, all that kind of stuff? This is Russell Mitchell from Exile Cycles. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good, Alf. I'm good, man. I, I haven't had an intro like that in a decade. I don't know. Well, I, I, well, I tell you what, it's it's a, it's a, it's amazing to have you on the show. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, listen, tell us a little bit. You know, for for people who've been living in the cave, right, for the last twenty years or whatever, uh, tell people what you do. Well, I'm a custom motorcycle built called Exile Cycles. I started that 25 years ago. This is our 25th anniversary. Um, so there's sort of two strings to that bow. I build custom motorcycles, ground up from scratch. I also will tear into a Harley soft tail typically and you know take that down to the frame and then rebuild that. Um, but alongside that, Exile Cycles has a complete range of parts for guys that are building a chopper in their garage or guys that are customizing their Harley, everything from wheels to brakes to handlebars to foot pegs to fenders, basically the whole nine yards pretty much. Um, so the bread and butter, if you like, of Exile Cycles is a mail order based business for these parts. Um, but I get to build a few bikes a year, ground up. We also offer a bike kit program, which is sort of a halfway house. We'll sell you every last part you need to build your kit bike on a pallet, ready to go. Um, so that's it. So the, 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 the business is parts, but the passion is the bikes, and the bikes build yeah. the reputation that sell the parts. So, Right. Right, fantastic. I've been a fan of yours for, for for a long time, even before the shows. Really, I, I just love, I, I just love your your stuff. Now, I, I never forget, I never forget when you were doing the you know the TV shows uh, a while ago, the biker build off stuff, and I, and I can't remember. I think there's one line you said. I can't remember. You said, you know, it's about black bikes. You know, and you just said, well, black. That's it. You only ever need a black bike. You said something like that, and I, and I could not agree more. It's basically all these other. All these other bikes, you know, they look like, I think you said they look like Christmas trees. You know, they're just, uh, you know, back then. It was, it was a yeah, bit yeah, too yeah, much yeah. for me, you know. I, I, I just like simplicity. And, you know, your kind of bikes are, or your designs. I mean, if I just bring up your website here, right? I mean, just look at this. Well, there we go. Look, you got all your Exile specials there. And the names of these things are just brilliant. A fat bloke. I mean, who comes up with a name? Fat bloke. You know, I, and, uh, I, have, a, I have a very good friend in London, and, and his name happens to be Fat Bloke. So <laughs> name, that, name that after him. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's stuff like that. I mean, that, that's why I kind of, you know, I, I kind of like that. You know, that's, um, that, you know, that kind of humor uh, in the bikes. But I say, you know, the quality of these things is fantastic. What made you you know, go into this kind of style? Was it something that you've always been interested in or it was something that kind of evolved uh, over a period of time? It did kind of evolve, I have to confess. I mean, I started as a teenager as a scooter boy. So it was uh, chopping Lambrettas that I started and the very first vehicle was a Lambretta chopper that I named Exile. Yeah. And that was, you know, pearl white with gold leaf flames and you know, mural on the tank and twisted hex forks and you name it. So chromed up the yin yang. Um, but I, you know, Exile 2 was flat black. I sort of learned my lesson pretty early on. And just kind of in life in general, you know, architecture, furniture, everything sort of moved towards becoming a bit of a minimalist and realized that, you know, not to sound too cliche, but less is more. And the more you condense almost any object to its purest essence, the yeah. more beautiful it becomes. So Absolutely. Yeah. I kind of carried that mantra over into my bike building. And when I started Exile Cycles, uh, the first couple of bikes I built were black, polished aluminum, no chrome, no color. Uh, and, you know, they went down a storm and they kind of created a 
a benchmark, I guess, which we started yeah. from. And, and from there, we've really just sort of gone more industrial, brushed aluminum, as you know, stainless yeah. steel. Um, and it's worked out in a way because it's, it's a timeless style. That's the nice thing about minimalism. It doesn't yeah. have anything really to do with fashion. So yeah. way more by luck than judgment, my bikes and my parts have been able to yeah. make this the test of time. But, you know, yeah. I'm building a bike for a guy from Holland right now. And that bike, you wouldn't be able to tell it from a bike I built 20 odd years ago. And that's the way I like it. And that's the way he likes it. And, and in a way, I think that's better for the customer. You know, you've still got a bike, you can hold your head up and ride 25 years from now. If you had one of those, you know, lime green and pink, dripping, teardrop flame, massive soft tails from the mid-90s, you know what I mean? You'd be putting on a disguise in a tinted full-face helmet to be seen riding that round the block these days. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, yeah. I think, you know, some of those bikes, as you say, if you can ride them 25 years down the down the line and they, and they still stand the test of time. You know, for me, you are... <laughs> I know this is going to sound really daft, really, but you're like the Frank Sinatra of bike builders. You know, it's everybody loves a bit of Frank. You know, it doesn't matter if, you know, what kind of music you're in. You know, you put Frank on a stage. He's been dead for 20 years, whatever. You put him on a stage, you can still knock out a tune. And, and that's what, what I mean. It's classic, uh, classic. Uh, I think more Tom Jones, perhaps, or Barry Mann. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> now, li listen, we, you and I, right, we have uh, a bit of a connection. And you didn't know that I'm surprising yeah. you with this. We have a little bit of a connection. And I'm going to tell you why we have a connection. Right. You were you were brought up in uh, the West Country, weren't you? In uh, uh, just north of Bristol, Frampton. Frampton on Seven, wasn't it? Something like that? Yeah. Frampton, Frampton on Seven in sunny Gloucestershire. Right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, I used to work uh, around that area, uh, South Gloucestershire, Gloucester and Cheltenham. Uh, I've got a cousin who lives down the road uh, in uh, Lydney, uh, which is uh, just just yeah, down the way. Uh, but yeah. And uh, uh, also, I grew up on a farm. So I, uh, I used to uh, deal with a lot of vets. What am I on about? You <laughs> used to be a vet or you trained to be a vet. How the hell do you go from being a vet, having your arm up a cow's ass, to building bikes? <laughs> Good question. You are correct, sir. I did go to vet school. I became a veterinarian. I moved to London and was a uh, you know a small animal, you know, pet there for five years and uh, loved you know London and had a great time. Um, but I got the chance to come over here to California and just you know look at the weather and the girls and you know this was. Uh, Right at the start of the 90s, when, and I can remember, but we were in a massive economic uh, collapse in England. The yeah, mortgage yeah. rates were up in the teens, you know what I mean? I, 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 you know, sure. I was barely keeping a, a shitty one-bedroom flat in Tottenham and a, and a rusty old Z650 on the road as a vet, you know what I mean? And yeah. I looked around here, I you know, make more money as a pizza delivery boy here in California than I could in London as a vet right then. So decided I wanted to stay over here. And whilst I could have been a vet in the US, um, I would have had to repass or I would have to have passed the US veterinary exams, which I was eligible to take right. anytime I wanted. But the problem was for me, I never wanted to be a farm vet. I never wanted to you know, know about the egg to feed ratio on a battery hen farm. But we had to learn 60% of what we had to learn in university was all this farm economic business vet yeah. stuff. And it was you know, a lot of work. And I was just really not prepared to learn that same pile of unnecessary information a second time just to throw it away. I couldn't face it. And, um, you know, I did the whole struggling actor thing. I, I used to be a model back in the day. So that kind of segued me into the whole struggling actor thing. And... Um, you know, had a great time yeah. doing the whole Hollywood thing. And then eventually, uh, you know, started up playing around with bikes as a hobby and, you know, had a lot of interest from guys locally and hobby went to um, business, which is a you know interesting story how that segued. But, you know, it sort of went from a hobby to a business and never looked back. So, 
There you go. Uh, let's I mean, let's sort of elaborate a little bit on that. You know, you you, know, you, you say you started building the, uh, the the scooters, or you know, just for fun, really. Your first yep. one was the XR one. I've seen pictures of it. It looks really cool. And then and you went to from that to building, you know, the custom bikes. I mean, why? I mean, had you built a custom bike in the UK before you went to the states, or did this all happen when you went into the states? All right, I'll try and keep this concise, but it is a story. Yeah. So, yeah. so what happened was Exile, you know, Exile One as we now know it, but in that yeah. at that time we just called it Exile. We yeah. had no idea what was coming. Um, was you know a very intricate custom Lambretta, you know, and for for people viewing at home who don't really know what a custom, you know, this was a lamb chop. This yeah, yeah, was yeah. Oh, yeah. down to the frame, extended, twisted, yeah, yeah. forced motorcycle handlebars, coffin tank, the whole nine yards. Anyway, I tried to put it in the Kent Custom Bike Show, if you remember that from yeah, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. So I wrote to the Hells Angels and yeah. said, hey, I want to put my scooter in your bike show. And they wrote back a very nice letter and said, look, whilst it's a very cool bike, we can't really guarantee the safety of, you know, your Lambretta parked in our bike show, you know, back yeah, then. Yeah. Mods, mods and rockers were still a real thing back then. Sure, sure. Uh, so, but but come to the show anyway. So, buddy of mine lent me a Z650. I'd never, to be honest with you, I was, you know, barely 20 or 21 maybe. I, I hadn't even really ridden a big bike properly yeah. before. So, a friend of mine lent me a Z650, I rode all the way to London, turn up all the way up the M5. I got back, and the very next weekend, I went to a scooter rally, printed some raffle tickets, sold them off for 50 pence each, raffled the exile on the stage on the Saturday night, bought a Z1000 and a Z650, ripped that down, and Exile 3 was a Z650, sort of fairly predictable, you know, buckhorn apes and yeah. fat bob <clears throat> tank. But, you know, it got into Backstreet Heroes and... Um, you know, then I think Exile Four was a Harley, and so it so it went on. So I'd done a few, and yeah. you know, whatever I'd done was really dependent on what budget I had in my pocket at the time. But it was only over here that it sort of snowballed, if you like, and um, you know, I was able to really get into the Harley scene. Yeah, so. right. Okay. Uh, I mean, here's the next question: What are you? This is a. I suppose maybe a bit of a dark question, but you know, how long have you been riding bikes? But this is, I want to ask this one in particular. What has been your best time riding a motorcycle? If you could say this is, you know, is when I met my wife or is, you know, I took my <laughs> lad on the, you know, <laughs> that one. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? You know, it's, or you know, I was riding off into the sunset or was when I, you know, had a crash that time and I survived, whatever. What's been your best time riding a bike? Well, I mean, if we can define bike in the broader scheme of things, yeah. you know, I, I have to say, uh, and anybody out there who knows what I'm talking about will will know what I'm talking about, the, the days of my teens and early 20s in the scooter scene, I mean, that, yeah. that whole scooter scene, I mean, you know, big shout out to Gleevem Stacks, my, my club, still my club. Um, yeah. You know, those guys are still however many years it is, 40 years on, still riding the same scooters, still going on the same rallies, still drinking the same 12 pints of beer on a Saturday night. Yeah, We had, we had the best time, you know, yeah. not necessarily the riding experience of the riding, but the camaraderie and the weekends yeah. away and the getting drowned before you even got out of the village because it always bloody rains in England. Yeah. Uh, we had the best time. I mean, I had lots of lovely experiences over here. I mean, I live... If I could turn this thing round, you could see Mulholland Highway out of my window. Yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, anybody who knows anything about California, Mulholland Highway is one of the most beautiful riding roads in, in, in certainly in Southern California. So I live in some of the nicest riding territory out here. And, you know, I've done the Sturgis ride and, and, and a lot of beautiful stuff. And to go back to the whole discovery thing, one of the nice things about those biker builds offs were, you know, we got days to ride through some amazing scenery and, yeah. you know, make, making good buddies with other builders that, you know, you've never met before. You might not like their bikes, you know. And, you know, I was a shit when I first got into this. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on your TV channel. But, um, you know, I was an arrogant bugger. Well, I still am. But, um, you know, I hated everybody because I hated their bikes. But every one of these guys that I met in the flesh, they're all super nice blokes. Now they're all yeah, my yeah. friends. But back in the day, you know, I thought they were all the, you know, the antichrist because their bikes were so bloody ugly. But, you know, I mean, Arlen Ness, 
lovely bloke, you know yeah. what I mean? Lovely yeah. bloke. Um, um, so those were some really good times as well. So I've been, you know, I've had a lot of them. I'm getting up there, you know what I mean? So yeah, hard, yeah. To, hard to pin it down to one good experience. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, let's just sort of expand on that a little bit. You know, when you, when you sort of met these other uh, builders, or did you do you still keep in touch with any of the other builders from that era? Uh, that he did shows with, let's say, or do you even sort of hang out with other bike builders, or custom bike builders? Is it kind uh, of like a little, oh, look, it's Friday night, it's custom bike builder night down at the local Nag's Head, you know? <laughs> there you go. Um, well, this is a big country, so the local Nag's Head for each of those bike builders, you know, about a thousand five, miles five, five right. exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I don't just pop off and see Eddie Trotter for the afternoon because yeah. he's two and, half, two and a half thousand miles away yeah, from me. Right. But um, so I'm pretty terrible at it. I, I've always been a bit of a hermit. I, you know, I I try to operate. I don't know if I try to, but I do operate very sort of insularly. I don't really care about the industry. I don't care what anybody else is doing. I don't care what's in. I don't care what's right. I don't care what's wrong. I just do what I feel like doing. And it barely pays the bills, but I'm still here. So um, so I don't. But I do, you know, but we, we created a, a really good bond. During those three or four discovery, you know, gravy train years, and it was an absolutely unique time when you think about it. I mean, you know, guys whittling these custom bikes, they should never be on TV. We should never be famous. We shouldn't yeah, yeah. be, yeah, we yeah. shouldn't be making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But for a few years there, you know, our 15 minutes of fame was two or three years long. And we we really had a good run at it. And it was yeah. fantastic. You know what I mean? And you know, we got treated well. We got VIP, this, that, and the other fine hotels. So we we all create we all would meet up at every rally because somebody was paying for us all to fly in there and what have you. Sure. Um, so we created a really strong bond. So although I don't keep in a day-to-day -day contact or you know, Facebook friend any of them or yeah. anybody for that matter, um yeah. we still have a good strong bond and we see them from time to time. Thursday night, Easy Rider magazine is being relaunched, is having its 50th oh, year right. thing. Yeah. So I'm hoping to see a whole bunch of them on Thursday down oh, there. Right. House of Machines uh, we have down in downtown LA, which is a cool, you know, hip hangout, bike base, live music venue. So that's on Thursday, so I'll see a few. But, you know, there aren't too many that are that close. You know, Roland's down the road, but he's, you know, too big for me these days. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I can't afford to run in his circles. Um, but, uh, you know, good, good guys, all of them. They were all yeah. pretty much to a T, good guys. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, uh, let, let's just talk. Uh, let's just talk about you, shall we? Forget about no, the other Let's just talk, <laughs> let's just that, talk yeah. about you. Uh, look, look, you know, you, you talked about your your business, your business model uh, before. Uh, before, um, is it now more about? Oh, sorry, is it less about building the bikes and more about the parts, uh, or is it still about the bikes for you? Would you say? Well, or your company. Forget about you uh, as an individual, but more about you, uh, uh, your your company. I mean, what, good, you know, good, what pays the bill? What pays the bills? Is it is it the parts or is it the bikes? It's. Um, I would have to say it's the parts that pay the bills because they are not very labor intensive. If you see what I'm saying, you know they, you know they got to be shipped. They've got to be, um, you know, I subcontract the manufacturer of a lot of it. So. Uh, it doesn't take up a lot of my hands on time, whereas the bike building does. Um, so it, it, it is kind of the bread and butter. If you break it down the middle, you know what I mean? It's hard to say whether more of the annual income comes from selling bikes and kits or selling, you know, foot pegs and, and internal throttles. You know, our biggest selling part is our internal throttle. We sell hundreds and hundreds of those every year. Um so it's, it's, it's always been a pretty decent balance of the two, you know what I mean? The bikes is obviously the passion, you know, I, mean, I wouldn't want to get up every day and assemble internal throttles all day, every day till I yeah, die. Sure. Um, uh, but the fact that I get to, to build the bikes and get excited about them over and over again is really important, you know, it really you know, keeps you going, if you like. Sure. Um, and um, so, so it's, a, it's a fine balance. I don't think I could afford to survive just building two or three bikes a year because I'm not the fastest guy yeah. in the world. Um, but at the same time, I'd go probably 
you know, be bored stiff and be looking for a real job if all I was doing was sticking parts in boxes all day or, you know, yeah. like I say, putting bits yeah. together. So, um, so it's a good balance, a good balance. And it's been yeah. a, it's been fab that, you know, one sort of requires the other. So, so I've been able to take that whole, you know, I should be a bloke whittling bikes on the weekend for fun into a, I'm a bloke who actually gets to whittle bikes five days a week for a job. I mean, this is what I mean. This is what you told me off air. No, you didn't really. But we're going <laughs> to pretend that you did. Uh, you said, "Alf, I'm going to send you a fat bloke uh, kit uh, to the UK for free, and uh, I'm going to build it. You know, with my adjustable spanner, and, uh, and I'm just going to build it." Right. So here's here's my question to you: um, How easy? And I've I've built a couple of bikes, you know, I'm, but I'm nowhere, you know, I've I've, I've wrenched as the Americans like to say, uh, you know, I, I know, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing, really. Uh, but look, how easy is it to put these bikes together? You know, your kids. So if I if I say to you, right, I want, I want a fat bloke, send it over, send it over, Russ. Yeah, is it easy to put together? It actually is really easy. I mean. It's probably the easiest way you're ever going to find to build a custom bike because you know, each kit is dictated by exactly what the customer wants it to be. So you could say, hey, I can weld. I want to mount my fender. I want to weld the bracket on for the kickstand. I want to do all that. You know what I mean? I want to make my own nuts and bolts. So you can get it any which way you want. But the vast, vast majority of the customers, they want me to do all the fabrication so yeah all the bracketry is done on the frame the fender's been mounted the tank's been mounted I mean, it doesn't come mounted but it has been mounted yeah. and fitted it's basically a project that is ready to go to the paint shop yeah and then we package it or i package it whatever with um exactly the fasteners required each part comes with the fasteners to attach that part to the bike yeah, packaged with that part. So it's very hard to go wrong, you know, short of, you know, spreading it out on the grass floor and getting a big wooden spoon and mixing it all up and then I'm going to figure it out. If you are somewhat methodical and you're capable of spinning a wrench, as we Americans like to say, yeah. then um, it's pretty damn straightforward to put it together. The wiring is the one part that has, uh, you know, people scratching their heads and, and that's understandable. But our frames our bikes are really clean because a lot of the wiring and what have you, we keep very well hidden. Our frames come with tunnels through the backbone and the center post. So yeah. we can't send you the bike pre-wired because you're going to have to paint it first. So, so yeah. that's, that, that's probably the, the hardest thing to, to figure out. And, you know, a lot of these blokes will get their mate who builds cars over on a Saturday to help them get through the wiring phase of it, but bolting them together, easy peasy. I mean, right. back in the day, we would show up at a bike show, you know, nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and with a bike kit on a pallet, dump it on the stage. And by five o'clock on Sunday afternoon, we'd have it hot wired and revving it up on the stage. You know, whatever that is, you know, two right. days of standing at a bike show, bolt it together, get it running. Right. There you go. So that's it. Send it over then. Send it there over and I'll, right. and, and I'll do it and I'll do Excellent. it. Well, I'll, you need know, to, we're, we're, I'll, I'll need to wait until that appearance fee that we talked about off here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, hold on, wait a minute. I've, I've got it here. I've got it right here. <laughs> All right, listen, let's, let, let me just expand on that a little bit now. So let's say you, you – no, I know I appreciate it. It, it uh, depends on which market you'll be sending this kit out to. But let's say you send it out to the UK, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll go to you, Russell. So, uh, Mr. Mitchell, please send me a fat bloke uh, kit, right? So you send it all over, and I've fit in my uh, garage, but then I have to register it and all that kind of stuff. But how right. do I then make it legal to ride it on UK roads? Because uh, speedometers, uh, indicators, uh, all that kind of stuff. Well, more and more these days, people are ordering our bikes with speedometers and indicators, and we can do them mighty stealthily um, yeah. and, and still well within the exile remit of, you know, minimalism, if you like. Um, yeah. But I have to say the whole registration process is the responsibility, whoever's buying it. You oh, need sure. to know sure. what it takes in your country. I mean, as far as England's concerned, we've sent a few over to England slash Europe, and there are companies out there um, – that assist in the registration process and the legalization process. Now, the other thing that I find myself having a conversation with regularly with the customers, the difference between legal and registered 
are two different things. You know what I mean? You can have an MOT and a taxis. That does not mean that your Harley with its bloody loud Vance and Hind pipes is legal in every, you know, yeah, yeah. Every, you know, little nuance of the law. Um, but people aren't coming to me to buy a bike that has DOT approved, you know, airbags yeah. on it. They are sure. coming to to buy a bike that they can squeak through the registration process and, you know, yeah. ride around on the weekends and take to, to you know, they're like a bike haunt or what have you. So it is each to his own, um, which brings me very neatly to the other aspect of our business that uh, we talked about very briefly before is the Harley customization thing in a situation where you're in a country or a location or what have you, or, you know, you're nervous about the legalization or the registration yeah. of a complete ground up build. Um, we do offer now a broad range of parts that will allow you to take a typically and ideally a twin cam soft tail, particularly and ideally I like from like 07 when the six speed trannies came in, cause we all love six speed trannies to about 11 when the CAN bus electrics came in, because we all ate CAN bus electrics. Yeah. And um, that is a, is a great starting point for a bike. Uh, I got one over here. Maybe I can carry this laptop over and show it you in a minute. Oh, yeah. But yeah. yeah, let's see if we can walk and talk. Here we see. Well, yeah. chew, chew gum at the same time. Yeah. But, it's, uh, it's just like Annika Rice, uh, everybody, oh, watching this. Hey, oh, Travis, yeah. but, oh, this is easier than I thought, look. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so you can take a twin cam soft tail, and in this particular instance, an 07. Yeah. Uh, I can't see me and the bike at the same time. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, let's get beauty. further away. Further oh, look away. at that. Absolute beauty. How do I get that in? The, tell me when I've got it in the window. Yeah, you've got it in there. That's in there. Yeah. Are you seeing it good? Yeah, yeah. So, so that is one of my bikes. That is an 07 soft tail standard with basically our catalog of twin cam parts thrown at it. And that is a complete bolt on. There's no fabrication. We didn't even strip that one down to the frame. All we did was cut the fender struts off the back because in the 07 model, those fender rails on the frame are not unboltable. But in, in 08, yeah. they, they actually bolt off. Yeah. That is a complete uh, bolt on project. I send you, you know, 10 boxes of parts with your yeah. mailman, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, you take your 07 soft tail standard or your 08 night train or whatever you want, you know, soft tail standard and night yeah, yeah. trains are, are our favorites because they're very uh, devoid of chrome to start with. Yeah. Um, and you, you bolt on your bits and pieces and you turn it into that or something along those lines. And there's a bunch of those on our website under the X Harley page yeah. of bikes that basically started life's Harley. So that bike, has a Harley title, the DMV and your policeman, they have no idea what's been done with it because you've never had to tell them. You know what I mean? You basically, um, you know, you've taken your Harley and you bought a few bits on mate, you know, and that's it. So you get to ride something like that, which looks, um, you know, what to me, 100%. I love that bike. I, I, I that bike is, is, is a really nice, if you could only own one bike, that is a really good example because it's got all the modern nice, you know, you turn it on, it tells me what the time is right in the middle of the speedo. It's fuel injected, it's, da, da, da. So it's got, does everything that the stock Harley does, but it does it whilst looking tough as nails and, you know, gathers yeah. the crowd everywhere you park it. Um, so it's, it's a great compromise. And unfortunately, as time marches on, it does become harder and harder to register ground up builds around the world. I mean, we, we're a, <laughs> it's hilarious to say, but we're a global company. You know, yeah, yeah. we're yeah. just as likely to be sending a bike or a bike kit to a bloke in Australia as we are to a bloke down the road in California. Yeah. In fact, you know, Californians are well known for their poor taste, and therefore we are most unlikely to be sending a bike to the bloke down the road in California. <laughs> you know, what I mean, they all scratch their heads when I show up at the uh, rock store on a Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But. Um, but would, uh, would you, you know, with this aspect of your business, is that, uh, would you say, was that a really popular, uh, was that a, a, a big part of your business now, the bolt-on parts for Harleys? Or would you still, it's kind of like a third, you know, it's, it's not really, it's yeah, not really it's, more so than any other part. Yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely not taken over. It's, you know, maybe on a par, um, 
with with the bulk builds. I I would you know if I don't build enough of them to really get my head around what yeah. the project, but you know we might do a couple of ground up builds, one Harley transformation in house, and then a uh, same thing bike kit. Some yeah. bloke with a Harley who's just ordered fifteen grand's worth of bits out of our catalog to um you know make that happen to his bike. Um, so it, it's a it's a strong piece, but not an overriding piece necessarily. Yeah. What what I am finding is uh, it does seem that, you know, we've had a fairly strong economy. Blokes like you and me, believe it or not, are getting up there a bit. You know what I mean? Um, oh, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, no. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing 60, so you no, must be more, you no, know? Yeah, you're only about 22. <laughs> I'm looking yeah. at up here, yeah. mate, up here. <laughs> yeah, Still 17 here. in here, mate. But... Um, yeah. But um, but I, I I I do find that there are guys that are whatever in their fifties or what have you are kind of sort of saying to themselves, you know, the the you know the environment's changing, the the world's changing. I'm getting up there. I need to get out and bloody have a chopper or a ground yeah. up build or a rigid while I still can, while I can yeah. still ride it, while the government will still allow me to have it, while Russell's yeah. still breathing, while whatever. Um, and God bless him. You know what I mean? I, I'm building a bike for a guy in, in Holland right now. He knows it's going to be a bitch to register that thing. Yeah. And he says to me, he said, Russell, look, I'll deal with it. And if I can't, I don't care. I'll have a bike in my living room that I want to look at all day. And if I yeah. ride it illegally once a month, then screw him. That's what I'm yeah. going to do. I want it anyway. And I'm like, you are the man. You know, you yeah. are the man. Yeah. So I thought that was fantastic. Um, and, you know, obviously we get other people who will do a year of hard labor trying to figure out whether they can or can't register it and, you know, getting all the right contacts and what have you. But, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, yeah. you know what I yeah, mean, absolutely. in most cases. And if there isn't, then you modify your Harley. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Right. OK, next question then, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, here we go. Here we go. Now, uh, do you ride socially or and where do you ride in your area, let's say? Or is okay. it always kind of business riding? Let's say you went down to the local, I don't know, the bike night down at, you know, every Thursday or whatever you said. Uh, do you go there on a bike or do you, you know, go in your pickup truck, you know, your Ford 250 or whatever? They, um, you know, normally, if it's a bike thing, I, I will ride a bike. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah. you know, I'm not saying I'm roughy toughy anymore you know what i mean but you know it's a little embarrassing to show you know to be russell mitchell and shop at bike night in a car unless there's a bloody good excuse you know what i mean yeah. like it being you know under 60 degrees or something like that but um you know what's um, the matter with you look at yeah. you what's the matter with you look, but, you, um, that, you got the suntan you got the white teeth and now it's uh, and now it's sixty degrees. I got a filter. I got a filter on this computer. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one of those things. What the kids do with their Instagram? Or oh yeah, oh, yeah. You, right, you're yeah. lucky. I switched off the Bambi Ive bit. You oh, know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I I ride. I ride. I, I'm 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 a busy man. I mean, I have yeah, sure. You know, I have a collection of ex-wives. I have uh, a five-year-old son. I have a six-year-old daughter. I have a twenty-year-old son. And, you know, I have a business that, you know, barely pays to, to support all of that nonsense. Yeah. Um, so I do, I work a lot. I work a lot. But thankfully, I like my work. And, you know, wise man once said, you know, find a job you like and you'll never work a day in your life, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Um, so I don't get a lot of time to ride. Sundays is my typical riding time. Um, and as I said, I live you know, two inches away from all Holland Highway, which is great. The rock store, which I expect a lot of your your folks know about, is a mile from my house. So the, oh. the big the big SoCal biker hangout is not quite viewable out my window, but it's it almost almost. Um, so it's there. We get down onto PCH. We go to Neptune's Net, and there's an endless array of gorgeous canyons to ride through. Yeah. You know. Hour ride through the canyon, pop out on the coast, hit Neptune's, have a beer, do it all, come back, hit the rock store. My favorite little cowboy restaurant called The Old Place is just here. And then there's the Sagebrush Cantina, who any, you know, self-respecting or self-disrespecting biker that ever visits the Los Angeles area has to check out um, yeah. for Sunday afternoon fun. So, so you know, we do that on a Sunday. Um, I was holding an annual event every year in October, 
uh, at a place called Paramount Ranch, which was like a little movie set cowboy town on, on a park here in the Santa Monica Mountains. But we were slap dab in the middle of the Wolsey fire and that burnt to the ground like most of my neighbors did. Um, and um, so that's been put on hold for a bit. But that was good because it forced me to get out on the weekends and figure out wherever the bikes were going to be and ride there and give out flyers and spread the word and go to Laughlin. And, and it really made me get out there and do the promotion. Um, yeah. So it was a really good excuse to go out and ride. You know what I mean? Because you yeah. know, sometimes you get to the point of, oh, I really got to finish this thing. I should yeah, just sure. you know, give it up and put in six hours on a Sunday. So I'm ahead of it for the week. And, you know, before you know it, you've done that and then you're dead. So yeah. It's nice to have some foot up the ass to make me get out there and and ride, you know, at least once a week, if not more. So there you go. You know, you know when you're out and about riding, let's say, uh, whenever you do that, do you get um, one? Do you get recognised by you know different generations of rider? Two, is there any kind of hassle? Uh, or is it kind of oh can we have a selfie and it's kind of like selfie selfie time or or is it a lot cooler than that you know just like no that's that's Russ that's that's our mate Russ you know we we, well, we don't talk to him. we don't talk to him because he's you know because he's English you know we might nod if he accidentally <laughs> catches by you know what I mean um, <laughs> no there, there's never never is and almost never has been any hassle. Ron Simpson once tried to beat me up because he thought that I claimed that I brought the big tire craze to America and he thought his dad did. And, um, but, um, you know, a couple of other blokes got in the middle and, and you know, I think we've kissed. Yeah. I mean, Ron Simpson and I get on great, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, I think it was something to do with we'd both been drinking loads of beer in a strip club in Daytona, you know, blah, blah, blah. But other than that, yeah one one or two small you know unnecessary bar fights um it's always very very uh lighthearted um a lot of the locals you know, they just know me because i'm out there almost every weekend yeah. get the occasional because the rock store is you know sort of a biker tourist location yeah. you do get folks like oh man we're in from canada or wherever you yeah. know can we take a picture of you what i get a lot of is Oh man, I grew up watching you on TV, which uh, you know, you, you don't like that, but you know, I get that almost no. fi almost fifty percent. Oh my god, man, can I take a picture with you? I grew up watching you on telly. I'm like, yeah, oh, damn, yeah, damn. yeah, but, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. There you, you go. But you know, uh, I can't as, as we would say, jog on, jog yeah, on. Yeah, son. yeah. <laughs> but, but but you know what? Somebody once told me, you know, getting old sucks, but it's a lot better than the alternative. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true, yeah. Right, okay, here's, here's the next one then. Um, what was life like after Biker Build-Off and uh, Build or Bust, uh, which I really enjoyed, by the way, as a TV programme or, or a concept of a TV, TV programme? What was it like? What was life like after that period? Because you said, you know, you, you're going through the heady days, you know, it, it, you know, a lot of money and attention and notoriety and fame was coming your way. But then it stopped, or the TV show stopped. Yeah, you know, it what was like after that period. It, it was it was quite interesting, I have to say. As you say, it, it, it's it's a little hard to exaggerate how overexciting that whole Discovery era was. You know what I mean? Way mm. you know, way above what it should ever have been. But uh, fabulous, and so lucky to have been a part of it and been able to you know make a bit of money while the while the sun shone, as it were. Um, but it literally was, you know, like one day in 2007, somebody unplugged the phones. I mean, literally business went from, you know, where's my hand? From here to yeah. here. And yeah. that was it. Stayed there ever since. It was literally like somebody had turned off the tap. But that said, we had a, a sort of window in that when the economy tanked, it yeah. tanked here first. So there was a few years where the dollar was incredibly weak compared to other countries. So all of a sudden, we were getting a call from the bloke in, you know, Gloucestershire saying, yeah. oh, my God, your bike kits used to be 30,000 quid, but now it's only 20,000 quid because the exchange rate is so good yeah. for us right now. So we were able to get a little bit of tail end business action. And also, once the Discovery Show went off the, t the, the TV here, it did disseminate around the world. So when yeah. I met um, my most recent wife, Rachel, um, 
we were very lucky in that we got to do some fantastic traveling on other people's dollars. We got invited to Brazil. We right. went to South Africa. We went to Sweden a bunch of times, Italy a bunch of times. We went, you know, I went to uh, Malaysia. We went um, all over the world um, on other people's time. And the timing was perfect for that because, you know, not long after that, we had a few kids, which stops everything fun happening. Yeah, yeah. So, you yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. well, you may or may not, but yeah, anyway, no, not. Yeah, your not. viewers at home know how that goes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But um, so, so it was, it wasn't completely off the cliff in terms of, of, of it all, but it was an obvious, and, and I'm bright enough to, to realize that that was what was happening. It was a yeah. slow, you know, it was definitely a decline that needed to be handled with. What I, uh, well, I don't normally tell the world at large, you know, huge audiences like yours, but what I was <laughs> quite proud of was, because um, for some strange reason, I was always, re I always wanted to be famous. I always wanted to be a, you know, whatever yeah. this, that, or the other. I was really kind of hell bent on that. And for, for, you know, for a minute there, I, you know, like I said, yeah. I got 15 minutes. But I was very proud of how I thought I would be devastated at the other end. You know what I mean? I yeah. thought, oh my God, oh, nobody recognizes no, no. me. But but I took it really, really well. And I think yeah, I sure. handled it like a big boy. And I'm, I'm very yeah. proud of myself for that. I was lucky and not so many were. I was lucky because when the money was flowing, I bought a couple of huge you know, huge house and a huge factory yeah. built or commercial building that I should never have been able to afford. Um, yeah. you know, when, when the economy tanked, I think my monthly mortgage bill was like 30 grand a month. And I was going under in, in a matter of months, yeah. but, but I was very lucky in that I was able to liquidate the real estate that I shouldn't have had in the first place at a really good price at a really bad time. So I was able to come Keep away it with it with a little nest egg that has allowed me to buy a nice house in the mountains and what have yeah. you. Um, but I could have easily been buried, and a lot of people were, you know what I mean? Because we yeah. all overstretched it. Everybody thought the yeah, yeah, sure. was never going to burst, ooh, custom chrome, too big to fail, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah. you know, if only we knew then what we know now, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, I would have, it would still all be under my mattress, I tell you. <laughs> but um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, was, was, was lucky on both accounts, really. Um, and have settled into anonymity quite nicely. Thank okay. you. Okay, let, let, let me ask you this, you know, because uh, you may or may not know, I'm a bit of a reality TV star uh, myself here uh, in the UK. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, now, I, I, I say it say, ain't so. <laughs> sorry? I said, say it ain't so. Is it, you cheeky so. so no, no, not I, not, I, not, I, you, I, not I, the UK I, bachelor. I, I. <laughs> No, no, I am. I am. Honestly, I'm not really, but I am. No, uh, but the interesting thing for me is this. You're doing your job, whatever your job is. Then all of a sudden you've got a camera behind you like this. Where's, where's my hand? My hand is there. There we go. Yeah, There's yeah, a yeah. camera right there. And you kind of always go, uh, you know, what's the, what's the best and worst thing about doing TV work or, or the sort of TV work that you were doing with, you know, the biker build off and, um, you know, build or bust? Well, I have to say, um, the two, two quite different things. Build or bust was, was a very specific show looking for a story arc with a hard ass director yeah. and, uh, you know, thumb screws being turned left, right and center. Was, um, he, was he the guy with the, the cigar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scott, you know, bless him, that's bless it, him. It. Great yeah. show, great show. But you know, he, you know, he's a he's a personality to get along with, uh, yeah. young Scott. Um, but he was an ass. <laughs> you said that, not me. I did not. I don't know him. I don't know me. He might have been a really. He, he, nice he guy. was not an ass. He just played one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> played it very well. He played it very well. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. He's a natural. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but the the biker build off was I thought fabulous in its own right because it was at such at the infancy of reality TV. Yeah. Even even Tom Beers, who is you know, like the god of reality yeah, yeah. TV, even Tom Beers at that point was naive enough to think that reality TV had to be something about reality. So we were actually 
building those bikes and doing those rides and having yeah. those deadlines. It wasn't like, okay, well, we've got the thing and now let's pretend the gas tank isn't here and bite our nails for a bit. And okay, yeah. we've got that scene shot. It was it was real. They were down, they were, you know, behind you waiting. And if something exciting happened, it happened. And if something exciting didn't happen, it didn't happen. And they filmed a lot of it. Um, I've always been pretty comfortable on camera anyway. Like I said, I did the whole struggling yeah, yeah, yeah. actor thing and what have you, and always, you know, been a bit of an arrogant git. So um, I took to it pretty nicely. And uh, in, in fact, you know, I think we ended up on Biker Build Off because I wrote to Hugh King and said, you know, you're doing Biker Build Off. I'm the best bloody bike builder in the country. Why am I not on your TV show? And, you know, oh, I love ne that. I love next that. day, next day, he called me up and we got together and, and we became good buddies. He, I like yeah, Hugh. Yeah. He was great. And Tom's a nice bloke, too. I, you know, Tom's yeah. a Tom's friend. Um, but did, um, you find, did you find that the cameras kind of got in the way uh, or would they kind of... Uh, kept their distance you know quite respectfully for uh, you know from what you're doing they were uh they were very professional the discovery yeah. crews were very professional you know it was the big budget show um really was top-notch stuff top-notch stuff and they you know at that time they had a, a monopoly on it you know every all the other channels went off and tried to do a bit of it in the country music channel and you know, maybe I'm jaded because I wasn't in those, but yeah. I felt they were all kind of sort of pale imitations of the original Discovery Channel biker build off. Um, yeah. And, you know, fantastic concept. And, you know, one of the highlights for me was, you know, we did that whole um, the biker build off awards show thing that we had in Vegas at the Hard Rock Hotel. I mean, that was just. The best of times. I mean, the, yeah. the, you know that that really was. You know that that was kind of it. I mean, that night was possibly the pinnacle of, you know, my career. Just because you know, I, you know, everybody there was friends. You know, uh, you know, we all got to dress. Uh, it was it was you know that was like the pinnacle of being treated like you know you were some yeah. sort of rock star when really all you were was a glorified mechanic who you know liked bikes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that a yeah, really good time. But anyway, I went off point a little bit there. Yeah. They were very professional. They didn't get in the way. They caught everything. There was never a, oh, you know, I didn't manage to catch you dropping that boulder on your foot. Could you do it yeah. again, please? Um, yeah. And for the most part, edited it together, uh, you know, and, and made a pretty entertaining show. I mean, I, yeah. uh, I really thought that trike one that we did with the Detroit brothers was was a great show and not yeah. just because you know they're easy to laugh at and uh, our trike was so fabulous but uh, yeah. you know um you know it, it just was it was humorous and and cool and you know really 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 good stuff good tv you know good yeah, yeah, no, it and stands the test of time stands the test of time now uh, maybe you can clarify something for me because i've heard a little rumor that uh, they they're, they're trying to bring it's back or, or the concept of the show back and if if it were to happen let's say i'm not saying if you have any inside information but let's say if it were to come back would you want to do it i don't have any inside information i would very much like to do it conceptually yeah um but the other thing with the Discovery Show well, and Builder Bus also, yeah. you know, huge. In, uh, you, we didn't get paid for that stuff. You've got no, to understand no. that most people don't realize that. No, Nobody no, no, paid sure. us for Biker Build Off. Nobody paid for the bikes. Russell paid for the bikes. You know, yeah. Russell paid for that truck. Fortunately, it was at a time when, when the company was making enough money that we could afford to. Um, you know, they would pay for the hotels and, you know, they would put on the shindigs. But um, we we had to finance that. Now, you know, whether I could afford to suddenly say, okay, I'm going to muck about for the next six weeks in front of a camera and build yeah. a bike out of my own pocket and tell the bloke in Holland who's desperately waiting to pay me the balance on this bike that he's going to have yeah. to wait another six weeks. You know, there's, there's always a way. Uh, yeah. You know, I would love to. The other, the other thing is, from a strictly business viewpoint, you know, you got to ask where the payback comes. Yeah. There's so many channels and so many different ways of viewing video content these days, yeah. you know, streaming this, that, YouTube, it, that. It, it yeah. is very, very, very different. So yeah. 
to be able to command those viewing audiences that the Discovery Show in particular was able to get, yeah. that is not easy in this day and age. You know, Game of Thrones can do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and, you yeah, know, major, major blockbusters can do it. But, but they, they had the girl Khaleesi and the dragons, some of that kind of help. Right. Stuff, but, you know, you, you've got you to gotta ask yourself, you know, am I going to do this, put it up on TV and get three emails that say, oh, I like your show, mate, but if I'd done it, I'd have painted it yellow. Yeah. And yeah. like, okay, that's great. Now I've got a bike that just cost me whatever it is, you know, tens of thousands of dollars out of pocket sitting here. Um, yeah. Just one more thing I've got to sell. So it, it would be, a, I would have to question how much it was going to encroach on, you know, day-to-day -day work and, yeah. and, you know, what the payback is. But I would very much like, I mean, yeah, I'd love to wave a magic wand and have those days back. You know what yeah. I mean? I'd love to, love to, love to have that, you know, presence um sure. but it but again the other part of it all and i'm not knocking your reality tv fame in any way shape or form because i don't know a lot about that um oh but, come on you're, you're my but, number one fan you know you are you told me before uh, before we came on uh start hey, recording you said i'll watch all your shows now don't spoil it don't yeah. spoil it. I said yeah, I was going to pretend to America. I watch it all. all the time, all the time, mate. <laughs> there you go. go yeah. There you go. Um, the, uh, the the I think that reality TV has somehow changed, and I'm not yeah, sure yeah. that my tolerance ethic. You know, I'm not. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'm down to sort of play some sort of patsy who's pretending to be angry at the engine bloke for no real reason. He's not yeah. really on the other end of the phone. You know what I mean? I like reality TV that is real. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know what I well, mean? Well, it's got to be. I mean, and, and also for the audience that would watch that kind of thing, uh, most would not would not stand for anything that's, you know, contrived. Well, you say that, though. You say that, but, you know... American oh, really? chopper, you, think? you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I, I, look how you know. I, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. I watch. I you know most reality TV these days. I find it insulting. It's like you know that guy yeah. didn't just come in with a bar of gold bullion that he thought was a Toblerone. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's it's just. You know, and I've I've had the call. You know, hey, could we borrow one of your bikes and we want to bury it in the back of a shipping container and make out that some bloke just found it after twenty years? Yeah. You know, yeah. No. No. Yeah. It, you know. So so, I'd be more interested in being involved with, and I tried to. I, you know, I, I, when the when the discovery thing was on a. Yeah decline or, or when the biker building thing was on a decline yeah. I, I i spent some serious money and time and you know with publicists and agents in hollywood trying to um pitch some shows that were much more of the how-to i think yeah. the viewing audience would actually yeah like a show where you show them how you 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 make this or you know how they do that you know in, yeah. in the good old days of uh, document, well, not necessarily documentary, but you know, yeah. informative shows rather sure. than it all be about you know slapstick. Yeah. Um, so, no, um, look, look, I, I'd watch that. I'd watch yeah, no, that, I, I, I think I think there's a, there's a there's an audience for it. Yes, and even if there isn't, I think one would develop very quick. I mean, look how the home improvement shows have come on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I I'm you know, I'm. Uh, pretty hopeless in that really but i i love seeing the before and after stuff and i'm yeah. sure there's a lot of corners have to be cut for the budget but sure but you know the end result is there to be seen on the screen and yeah. it's interesting and it's interesting seeing how they get from a to b it's not yeah. about the you know oh she squirted him with whipped cream you know yeah, what yeah, a yeah. naughty little yeah. type that guy's wife is <clears throat> you know what i mean um but uh, that's how I think it would go. The whole head-to-head -head competition routine is, you know, it, it's a little tough to keep that going. Yeah, uh, sure. I, I think, you know, year in, year in, out, show in, show out, um, and to get the, the viewing figures. But anyway, yeah. long story short, would I like to be on TV? Yes. Would I like to yeah. be famous? Yes. Would I like to be rich? Yes. Am I happy, yeah. you know? Coping with none of the above, yes, you know. Yeah. 
Oh, an easy I, going. I, I certainly think out of all the out of all the people who who were on the TV at the time. And I'm not just saying that because you're, you know, right in front well, of me, but you're, you're halfway across the world. But modern technology, we're, we're face-to-face. Now, I mean, you know, you, you, it's not because I'm speaking to you right now, but you had that kind of presence. And I think whatever, if you were able to bring that to a different documentary-type show, like a how-to show, an engineering show, there is a massive amount of people out there who who watch this kind of stuff who would who would just absorb all that kind of stuff definitely well, that's definitely. very kind of you to say so and and i would love that kind of role i would very much like that role yeah. and um, i would like to be the host of some sort of like you say engineering gearhead yeah. type don't have to be motorcycles and i don't yeah, have yeah. to know anything about it in fact in a way the yeah. show where I don't know anything about it and I'm the interested party going in there and knowing enough to ask the smart questions that will yeah. educate the viewers at home. I think that's great. I would love to be a host of something yeah. along those lines. That would be fantastic. If any of you producers out there are watching, all of them, uh, get on to Russell. And yeah, on, there you go. go. That's what Book, it. Book it, Dano. <laughs> Book it, Dano, right. Okay, next question then. Uh, look, these are brilliant. These are really good. Uh, next question for you. Uh, has your style, and I'm not talking about your physical appearance because that kind of has changed a uh, little bit. Oh, mine yeah. has, you wouldn't believe that mine has changed a little bit over the years as well. You wouldn't believe that. But anyway, uh, I uh, yeah. Before I uh, I used to have long flowing hair and all sorts of things. You're not right, that but... motorbike show guy, are you? <laughs> <laughs> but has your style changed over the years? And what other types of builds would you like to do? Uh, no, is the, and no, pretty much <laughs> are the are the answers to that. Um, my style has not changed really over the years. Yeah. Um, I am doing a bike for Michael Lichter's exhibition at Sturgis this year. He's yeah. doing a, a an exhibition that's uh, sort of based, I guess, on builders that have stood the test of time and had, you know, over 20 years of bike building, blah, blah, blah. And as yeah. it's my 25th anniversary, um, I'm going to build a bike for that, which is going to have... Uh, I think the, it's going to have a slightly more modern palette, a little bit something slightly unexpected. But, yeah. but you know, I'm not going off to the left field on anything ever, probably. Yeah. And as far as what other types of build would I like to do, um, there's one of the joys of being in my position over the years. I've kind of been allowed to do whatever I want to do. Um and, you know, for a time, that was all I would do. You know, you'd call up to yeah. order a bike and, you know, I'd pretty much tell you what you were getting and you'd like it or not. No, you can't have a different fender. Um, yeah. But I, and, you know, I'm going to lose a bunch of followers <laughs> with this, but yeah. I would like, I, I'm more intrigued. I, I sort of feel like I, I'm, I'm ready to go off in, in both directions. I would like to be able to, do something with the electric bike world, yeah. although I'm yeah. I'm afraid that that is a difficult um, platform to to really sort of build on because weight is so important. So all the yeah. manufacturing techniques that you know yeah. the Harley crew have, let's take a massive lump of metal and whittle it a little bit and weld yeah. it right on the side. No one will ever notice the extra fifty pounds. Yeah. Um, so that's difficult. Um, and also there's so so little to it you know it's a it's a box of power you know with it runs a back wheel um but i would like to be able to to play around with that but that's an expensive arena to get into i'm gonna have to yeah. wait for the right customer to come along and say you know here you know i know you don't know what you're gonna do but here's a live wire and here's 30 yeah. grand do something cool with it yeah and and i would also like to go back in the other direction and start playing around with pan heads and what have you like everybody else does but i but i don't see how i can monetize that to a level that allow yeah. me to stay in business you know what i mean sure. that is sure. that's my retirement plan when i don't have to do it for a living then that's what i wouldn't mind doing for fun you know what i mean yeah. buying a used whatever an old shovel head or what have you and just <laughs> simply 
refine it and making it cool. I love the fact that there's such a resurgence of this old iron. I love the fact that there's a resurgence of so many different genres and brands, yeah. you know, none of which helps me make any money. No. Um, but it's refreshing to get out to the bike events and see some interesting bikes of all types and ages. You know, yeah. I was a big fan of the, you know, the straight fours back in the eighties, you know, um, but again, I don't really see how, you know, the sort of money that I need to make to, to keep the doors open sure. is oh. hard to, to justify. I'm not, you know, Jesse James where, you know, he's got guys who'll just chuck him 120 grand to do yeah, whatever yeah. And, and he does whatever he wants and he gives it them and everybody's happy. He's Jesse yeah. James. I'm not, you know what I mean? I have yeah. to, I have to deliver value for money yeah, and, absolutely. you know, my ground up bill bikes start at 50 grand, um, which seems like a lot of money, but you know, at that level, you know, that's, that's sort of survival pricing for, yeah. For, for, yeah. for my company. You know what I mean? And, you know, hard to tell somebody, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to pick up an old pan head and then we're going to spend $40,000 on it, making it look black and simple. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so that, that, yeah, okay. that's it. there are a lot of things I would like to do, but very few of them will fit in a financially viable business model. So those are things that I'm saving for uh, retirement, if ever such yeah. a thing comes my way. Okay, okay. Right, it, it, are we, we kind of a touch on this already. You know, what, what do you think about the future of motorcycling, you know, electric motorcycles? Uh, would you ever buy one? Or would yeah. you think, no, I'm, I'm never going to buy one? You know, I'll No, I, I have one. to say... I came into motorcycling perhaps by a different from via a different route from everybody else. Perhaps I would, you know, my dad you know, barely figure out how to put the key in the ignition on a car, let alone know how to open the hood yeah. on it, as you English folks like to say. Yeah. Um, so I, I would never had any of that gearhead mentality, never really understood how any of it worked. Um, but I knew that I liked the coolness of it all. And I knew that I wanted to own this cool. I mean, I, I tell everybody, the only reason I got into custom bike building was because it was the only way that the bike in my head was going to become the bike in my garage. So I yeah. basically had to learn everything that it took to get the yeah. bike I wanted to be the bike that existed. Um, and turns out that I was fairly good at it. And, you know, I, you know, became able to machine and weld and do all of these things. I'm not an expert at any one of them, but I can do all of them well enough to, to, to create the bikes that I want to build. Um, so that was also, you were all self-taught on that as well, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I had, I had a sort of mentor back when I, uh, or probably in the year or so before I started exile cycles, yeah. an old guy called Chuck Walker, who was a retired machinist, but he had a machine shop at the back of his garden. And I, again, brief side story. I'm full of yeah. them. Um, no, no, I, I, I designed a set of triple trees or yokes, as you like to call them, yeah. and um, I needed them made. And everybody was quoting me, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to make. You know, one-off machining is expensive, and these yeah. things have complex curves. So somebody told me about this bloke. I went to meet him, and I said, "Look, I want to make these triple trees. Here's my drawings. Um, here's the aluminum, you know, big block of inch and a half aluminum, yeah. you know, massive chunk. Um, you know." can you do that for me? He's like, well, maybe, but first step is we got to saw them up into triangles. Here's the die chem. Here's the scriber. Here's the saw. Here's the on button. Don't yeah. cut your fingers off. Knock on the door when you've done it. So I cut them into triangles. He's like, well, next thing is we've got a board of the threaded holes. You know, here's the mill. Here's the on button. Here's how yeah. you think this is a tap. You know what I mean? And literally a month later, day yeah. in, day out, we had these triple trees and like on the last yeah. hurdle last day turned the bloody handle on the mill the wrong way the end mill went jumping into my beautiful triple tree you know world's yeah. collapse I'm like oh you know almost in tears and then yeah. i broke in the in the machine shop i was like what are you crying about you know like oh man i've just ruined this thing i've spent weeks making this yeah. part and he's like well this is a welder i'm like yeah but this is aluminum he's like and you can weld yeah. aluminum. You can weld aluminum. And so yeah. here's the on button. Here's the thing. Here's the hood. And, you know, boom, it's a whole new world. And so within, you know, several months of this meeting, I'd learned to yeah. weld and machine and, and, you know, basically, and, and, you know, I know a lot of your, your viewers out there probably, you know, are out there in their garage or whatever with wrenches and whatever, but 
when you can operate a lathe and a mill and a welder, the entire world changes. It's like a yeah. revelation. It's like you can create anything. I yeah, mean, some of it's hard to do and it'll take yeah. you a long bloody time, but you can make anything. There, there, there is no limitation anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. um, and uh, for, for, for a while when Exile was getting off the ground before I could afford to buy a mill and a lathe, I would literally just rent time off this bloke and go and use his machine shop yeah. You know, typically on a Saturday, I'd save up all the machining I had to do and go over and what have you. So he was, and, and I, you know, my, my catalog is still dedicated to him. Wow. He was sort of my mentor, my teacher, um, you know, my inspiration at some level because he was just, you know, some old bloke that, you know, had a machine yeah. shop in his back garden and lived like a hermit and made whatever the hell he wanted to and diddled with this, that, and the other. So, uh, but, but other than that, no, no formal education whatsoever. And, I can only imagine what a powerful force I would have been had I spent all yeah. them years I did in vet school actually learning yeah. to do something <laughs> useful, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a mechanic or a, you know, a design engineer or something, but no. Um, so, yeah, self-taught uh, almost all the way. And then to back to your electric bike yeah. question, because I, I once again went off on a tangent. Yeah, that's um, great, man. Love tangents, me. Um, yeah. I would very much own one. I, I've got to say, because yeah, – there, that's where we came in – because yeah. I'm not a gearhead – I don't have that inseparable love of the gasoline engine that yeah. so many, you know, American, you know, they'll, they'll fucking burn me on the stake if they catch me saying this because they all grew up with muscle cars and their dad's wrenching on the Camaro in the driveway, you know, um, but I didn't have that. Um, and I really like the, the idea of that silent, incredibly torquey power you know, like zooming along on Harry Potter's broom. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, I haven't yet got into the whole electric car thing, but, you know, it's coming. I mean, I know yeah. it's coming over there. I see him on the M5 when I'm, you know, or the M4 when I'm heading from Heathrow to my mum's. And, um, but over here, you know, Tesla's taking California by storm. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, sure. Every day, just more and more and more Teslas. And everybody that owned one absolutely raves about it, would never dream of going back to anything else. So I'm sorry, world at large, it is coming. And yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm afraid we are at the end of an era. We are yeah, at the yeah. end of an era. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you and I will ride it out. But, you know, my youngest kid, there won't be hot rods or... Harleys, uh, you know, not, not, you know, V twin 2000 CC gas guzzling Harleys when he's my age or when, you know, when he's retiring, you know what I mean? It is all changing. Um, and like it or not, I fear that we are going to have to learn to accept that, uh, you yeah. know, electric power might be the way of the future, whether I ever mess with it or no, um, it's coming, you know what I yeah. mean? And, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not wishing it along. Uh, you know, I, I I hate change. You know, what I mean, I yeah, wish Harley, yeah. I wish Harley was still making the bloody evolution soft tails where you knew where everything was and you could do everything. And you know, fuel injection was never invented, and so on and so forth. It just yeah. makes everything so much more complicated for what we want to do. Yeah. Um, but electrics electrics come in, and um, I don't think there's much we can do about it. Yeah. Okay, right. Well, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I totally agree. Actually, I mean, you know, if you'd asked me about three or four years ago about electric bikes, I would have gone, nah, "No chance. I'm not having any of that." Uh, but now I'm, yeah, I'm very pro. I'm, you know, I'm very accepting that that's the future. So, you know, well, why fight it really? And not to harp on on it, but you know, it's it's absolutely in its infancy. But already, you know, yeah. some of those bikes at zero are turning out. Yeah, and, yeah. And even the live wire. Yeah. Good look good looking bikes you know what yeah, i mean yeah, yeah. they're Absolutely. good looking bikes you know okay oh yeah but you can't go more than 100 miles yeah. okay you can't go more than 100 miles this year but that's yeah. this year you know what i mean five years from now 10 years from now yeah you know absolutely what I mean? how far can you go on your sportster yeah how far yeah. can you go with your 65 year old bones before you need to get off and stretch anyway you know what yeah, i mean yeah. how Absolutely. far do you really ride every week you know what i mean yeah. in reality you know what i mean you know, yeah i don't you know, yeah, I, pro I probably only did 100 miles yesterday on my Sunday shit and mucking yeah. about. I could have probably done it on a live wire and still had enough charge to get up the pub last night, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a, a proponent, but it is coming and, and it's yeah. only going to, the bikes are going to look better, they're going to function better, and, you know, you can kick and scream all you like, but yeah, coming. 
Absolutely. Right. Okay. Your, but let's get back to your, uh, your, uh, bites, right. Your, your, uh, that you can build for your customers. And, uh, now you, uh, you, uh, provide a uh, Harley engine, uh, or total performance. Is that right? No, not really anymore. Um, oh, ah, right. Be I'm, because I'm behind the curve here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, back in the heyday when you know we were turning out larger numbers of bikes. I mean, you got to and put it into context. I mean, even at our peak, yeah. we were probably not building more than maybe a dozen bikes a yeah. year as a company. Uh, you know, and now I probably do two or three complete yeah. bikes that, that I finish per year. Um, but um, back in the day. A crate Harley Evolution engine was a cheap and cheerful and very functional and fun to ride alternative yeah. to your big inch massive motor for your custom build. So we yeah. didn't build, we didn't in house build many bikes around Harley engines because it's like, okay, well, it's a $50,000 bike, but for $47,000, you can get it with the ATNC Evolution motor instead of the yeah. performance, total performance, you know, 120 inch engine. But Harley, in their wisdom, you know, I don't think they barely sell you a part to fix your Evo anymore. You know, try and yeah. buy a set of Fort Legs for a, for a mid 90s dresser, which are the Fort Legs yeah. that I really like to use on my bills. No, they're discontinued. There's only a million of them out there yeah. getting crashed. You know what I mean? Don't worry about you, mate. You smash up your front end, your bike's done. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, but they won't, you know, those are not available anymore. You can't buy yeah. a Harley Evo engine. So we, we build Harleys with Harley engines in them, or we yeah. modify Harleys, if you like, it may be a better description. Yeah. Um, but the total performance has been our engine of choice, typically for the ground up build. And that is primarily, I've got to say, I mean, we love the total performance engines and we got on great with those guys. And, you know, I've got a couple or three, I think on order right now. Um, SNS yeah. just can't lay off the Chrome. They will sell you a crate engine, but yeah. it's going to have Chrome tappet blocks, whether you like it or not. And I really just begrudge the fact that you'd buy a case motor with a guarantee and then you'd have to strip it a quarter of the way down to get the Chrome parts off get them stripped, get them polished. Whereas Total Performance yeah. as a company would listen to Uncle Russell. And when I say that I want every part to be polished aluminum, they would build it polished aluminum. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, sure. you know, obviously we're just a fly in the, well, not in the ointment, but, you know, a, a speck on the landscape for a company as big as SNS. They're not going to pander to my requirements at the numbers of engines that I buy. Uh, and they just... You know, they just wouldn't put together an engine that was devoid of chrome. Now they do that completely blacked out package, which yeah. is, a, is a viable alternative for a build or for a bike uh, kit customer. Um, but it was really the chrome. It was the avoidance of chrome that drove us into the arms of total performance in the yeah. first place. And what, what size engine uh, do you uh, just remind me what TP actually uh, produces? Is it 120? No. What was 121? One, is that? Yeah, they do a 121 and a 124, and we typically use the 121. It's a little cheaper, has a two-year warranty instead of a one-year warranty. Right. And, yeah, in all reality, you know, we're building rigid bikes here typically. Um, either one of them's got more performance than you're really ever going to put to yeah. serious yeah. use, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um and, you know, maybe the 121 is a little smoother, blah, 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 blah. but anyway, long story yeah. short, the 121 more than does it. And to be honest with you, as the customer base gets older and the custom scene differs, um, guys aren't so worried about that bragging, right? So uh, my buddy's yeah. got 121, so I need a 122. Sure, you know, sure. They'd all be perfectly happy with an 80-inch Evo motor with fairly low compression. Um, that... Um, yeah, you know, you know, doesn't um, you see, yeah, does guzzle the gas like it's going yeah. out of fashion. It's interesting. It's interesting you say that about you know about the uh, penis envy type thing, you know, with uh, you know Harley engines or or any sort of size engine. You know, Harley just uh, released a new crate engine. It was a one thirty one cubic inch, and I think what's the point? Why? What you know? Why do you need it that big? You know, I mean, I, I know but some people. Are, if you, if you got you got like I don't know uh, whatever an eighty eight cubic inch engine or a ninety six or one hundred three or whatever, uh, 
most people are never going to ride, you know, ride that engine or ride that bike to its full potential anyway. So, no. you know, do you really need a 131 or, or 124 or whatever? You know, I don't know. Yeah. What, what do you say about that? Well, I, I say each to his own. I, I'm, yeah. not a, I'm not a performance guy. We're not a performance company. I'm not. I like to think I'm a good rider because I'm still alive and I intend yeah. to stay that way. Yeah. Um, so I'm a safe rider. I'm not a you know stunt guy, ride like a maniac yeah, yeah. Uh, rider. But that said, performance engines. Um, I'm uh, you know I'm not a performance guy. We're not a yeah. performance company. I'm I like to think I'm a safe rider. I've you know stayed alive this long. But I'm not a you know I'm not a stunt rider. I'm not a fast rider. Yeah. I, I you know I don't know what to do with that kind of power. I'd be terrified yeah. on a Ducati. Yeah, blah 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 blah. Um, but, and I'm sure it's the same where you are, the, the performance dinas with the, you know, the club T-bars and the fairings yeah. on them are, are all the rage over here. Yeah. And some of those guys know what they're doing, man. Some of yeah. those guys, you know, those wheelie stunt rider, you know, oh, we yeah, have yeah, a lot yeah. of, a lot of, you know, sort of, um, I wouldn't call them stunt rider packs, but, you know, performance yeah. rider packs that, that get out and, you know, they really know what they're doing and, you know, and, yeah. And it's nice that you can build a bike in such a way that it that it is um, compatible with some of the, you know the 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 more performance brands. You yeah. know what I mean. You can still ride a Harley and do all that good stuff. For sure. me, maybe not so much. I actually, literally last week, bought two Dinas. One. Uh, it was the personal bike of my really good friend, Tom the Swede, who is an awesome bike builder. And, um, you know, I just wanted to own his bike and didn't, couldn't stand the idea of anybody else having it. So I bought that right. off him to own. And it's, it's a lovely Dyna, but it's, it's well tuned. It's, you know, like 135 horse, what have you. Great. Yeah. But the other one I bought because he was having a hard time selling it and the price was right. And I know they'll eat it up over here is a monster. It's a, it's a stage three, 117 inch, 145 horse, 145 foot pound torque beastie. Yeah. And, you know, I took that out for a ride and, you know, dropped a gear to try to catch the on-ramp and ended up, you know, with the back wheel locked up oh. too much compression. I'm like, okay, I need to, you know, need yeah, to watch yeah. myself yeah. on this thing. But, sure. um, you know, it, 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 it's each to his own, if you see what I'm saying, but, yeah, I, yeah. but for the most part, you are right. Most people are not going to need that 131 cubic inch engine yeah. and, and not going to know really what to do with it. A moderately tuned, much milder engine will give you all the power and top end and acceleration and touring capability that, that most yeah. people are going to need. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, next one. You touched on this already. Uh, how do you think the custom bike building seen not the so much a scene but the you know the way bikes are produced these days how has it changed in the last sort of 10 years well, we've already talked about whether you still whether you keep in touch with any other builders so we won't uh, yeah. talk about that but you know has it has it really changed since uh, well uh, fr from an industry viewpoint it's changed completely because the kind yeah. of ground up bike building that uh, you know, was rife during the discovery years yeah. has virtually disappeared. You know, I mean, yeah. guys that are manufacturing frames and building a ground up bike, buying a crate motor and, and creating something from nothing. That's almost unheard of these days. Yeah. Almost. I mean, I, I think it's starting to make a little bit of a comeback. I think touching back to the, you know, the yeah. proper guys that are in their fifties and realizing if I don't build that rigid that I always wanted now, I'm never yeah. going to be able to do it. Um, so it's much more gone in here anyway, and I'm sure the same where you are, gone yeah. into the realms of, you know, yeah. I found a, you know, a barn find pan head and I've stripped it down, had the frame repowder coated and yeah. sourced on eBay a set of skinny forks and what have you. That yeah. is where the, you know, the true custom bike building scene has been for the last you know, probably decade here. Yeah. Now, you know, that whole seventies retro red metal flake, gold pin stripe stuff. And I say it like I'm mocking it, but I'm not, uh, you know, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I actually think it's, it's fantastic. And if I was a working stiff, you know, that's exactly what I love that whole idea of, you know, on the back and going camping with your buddies on the weekend. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, it's grown up scooter boy. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, 
so yeah, no, I, but you know, and there are a few names out there, uh, companies that are able to do that um, and create quite a business doing it. You know, they're making their own you know, little oil tanks and stuff that are, that's all part of that build scene. So, you know, your lead sneds yeah. and your brass knuckles and your, you know, all of these, these companies, um, you know, they're, they're rising up in, in sort of whatever notoriety. And I'm hoping they're all making money and doing yeah, great. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you know, it's great that they are able to do that um, and do so. And it's way more interesting um, <clears throat> than sort of the stale period we had, I think immediately after um, yeah. the discovery thing. I think the, the bikes have been becoming more and more interesting, even if they've be been becoming less and less lucrative for uncle Russell, you know? Yeah. So um, there you go. So that, that's kind of the way I think that it's changed. Uh, everyone's like, Oh, it'll come back. It'll come back. It ain't ever coming back crazy. Like it was back at the turn of the century, as they say, I don't sure. ever, ever see there being that perfect storm of everybody's got a disposable income. There's some clowns on the Discovery Channel that makes everybody think they have to have a metal flake orange chopper in their garage. And, um, you know, and everybody's got way too much money. And if they don't, yeah. they're just borrowing it anyway, because, you know, the bubble's never going to burst, mate. Sure. Um, so that perfect storm of TV popularity, you know, choppers were the thing and then it was cupcakes and then it was tattoos and then it was home improvement. Uh, choppers are the thing at the yeah. time where everybody had the money. It does look there that, that there is a little bit of a comeback of that whole ground up custom building, yeah. you know, of the type that was, you know, very popular at the end of the 90s and what have yeah. you. Um, it won't be to the same level, no. but but I'm hoping it becomes part of the bike scene all over again. Um, yeah. It's it's becoming it's becoming very difficult. Every time I call a vendor, I'm worried that they're going to find out that they're out of business. You know, you pick up the drag specialties or the custom chrome catalog, and where there used to be like pages and pages and pages of you know sheet metal parts to choose from, unless you're building a big wheel bagger, we probably better not talk about those on your yeah. you know family yeah. friendly show. Um, yeah. You know, there, there's nothing for you. There's nothing yeah, yeah. for you. It just those those days. Th those days ago, they were, there was an absolute heyday, a perfect yeah. storm. So glad to have been there and, and ridden on the wave and, you know, talk about it in my wheelchair yeah, in, yeah. in my old age. Well, I think, you know, if, if anything, if anything, you're kind of the, the parts that you produce, those are the ones that kind of are going to last the test of time. I think for me, what I've seen uh, the last sort of 10, 15 years with, with custom bike building or there's been a much more of a fusion between bikes, merchandise, um, uh, lifestyle, cool, hip factors, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. I'm too old to be start talking about cool and hip, if you know what I mean. But, you know, the, the custom bikes that I see, or the builders, I see, certainly here in the UK over the last sort of 10 years, you know, you go to a show and they've got it all, they've got it all laid out. And it's, you know, they've got t-shirts and they got, you know, mugs cool. and they're doing their own little parts. And, and it's just like, oh, and they've got all really cool stands. You know, they've all got the, um, you know, the uh, the wooden crates, you know, all yeah, yeah, yeah. Up and it all looks cool, you know, and everybody's kind of doing the similar kind of thing. And they're all selling, they're doing helmets. They're not just doing strictly bike stuff now. They're doing like helmets and all, all other sorts of stuff as well. And that's what yeah, I'm saying. shirts. <laughs> Sorry? Plaid shirt. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> please, please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. I mean, they're, they've diversified into doing other things, and maybe, well, maybe that's the way they can survive. That's the way. Well, no, I, I think it go. absolutely is, and I think that is a reflection on the, the crowd that have, you know, because the Harley crew, you know, they're getting old, man. I, oh, you know, and I, we know Harley's struggling and trying to bring in younger riders, and at some yeah, level yeah. there will be. But you know, the whole Harley owners group thing. You know what I mean? They're they're a bunch of gray hairs who are never yeah. gonna get hip to fashion. Yeah. Um, but the the guys that are building the pan heads and the retro seventies choppers and have their grips this close together, and you yeah. know, um, those guys are into a whole sort of lifestyle thing. Yeah. And, it's not not necessarily my bag, but I I understand that, yeah, and I yeah. think that uh, 
you know, it's cool. This whole, like I said, we got this house and machine things here. We got a bike shed coming here. I know you have the bike shed in London yeah, yeah, and all of that. Yeah, you know, yeah. cool sort of venue, lifestyle, fashion thing. You know, it's it's a little manufactured, maybe. You know, it's yeah, a little different yeah. from your you know chopper club guy who made a pair of jeans out of an old bell staff and you know blah 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 yeah. back in the day when we were real bikers. But um, <laughs> you know. You you can't knock it. It's better than driving around in a Honda Civic, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, um, so, so yeah, but that is the way it is. But you can understand that. Like I say, a it's got to be hard to charge the kind of money to justify yeah. the time that it takes to build those bikes. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. and the other thing is they don't want to buy, um, you know, your your mass produced sprocket brake kits or your billet forward controls. Yeah. They want you to whittle one out of an old lamp that they found, and you yeah. know. They want their parts to be sort of one-off vintage with a little bit of, sure. you know, brass welded on or brazed on or what have you. Yeah. Um, so it's it's very much more of a, you know, at some level, maybe one-off bike building, which there is nothing wrong with that um, unless you're trying to make a living um, yeah. whatsoever. Um, but um you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, I think the lifestyle thing, A, perhaps is necessary to 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 create a business big enough to be sustainable. Yeah. And B, it's what's expected. You know, these people don't want to go to a crappy shed and, you know, they want to go to a place where they can meet their mates and perhaps yeah. have sausage and eggs while they, you know, check out the new Metal Flake helmets and what have you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, 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 it is what it is, but it, yeah. you know, it could be it could be a lot worse. You know what I mean? It could be sure, a lot sure. worse. Okay, my very last question to you, Russ. Uh, you know, I could speak to you for hours and hours and hours. I think if we had a, you know, we had a, a sausage sandwich and a, and a couple of beers, and we could be doing this all night. But yeah. we're, we're gonna we're gonna keep this last one. Now, right. would you ever build a bike that isn't to your taste? <sighs> So I've if tried. I said to you, if I said to you, right, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm at with my thinking, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say to you, Russ, I want you to build me a twi an old twin shocker dirt bike to go off doing uh, the Baja 1000 or whatever, or 500. I don't know. Do they still have that race over there? I want you to build me a bike that will go down the road and then I can take it in the dirt and it will be really cool as well. Would you do something like that? Well, that would be a bike to my taste. I got nothing against oh. a bike like that. And if you it's go, the, I told you, I told you we had a yeah. connection. I told if, you, you. if you if you go um if you go onto our ex Harley page, you'll see we did do a sort of super motard type yeah, Dyna yeah. that yeah. you know looks like it could kind of handle the roads and a bit of field as well. Yeah. Um, but in terms of you know really building a bike that isn't to my taste. In the early days, I, I kind of tried. You know, I got some customers that had money when I you know, was very first starting, yeah. and they wanted me to do this, and they wanted me to do that, and I I almost found it impossible. I just couldn't force myself to do the work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Am I a mercenary? Are you calling war less a hooer? You, you know, money puts food on the table. So somebody yeah. comes to me with a big enough budget – and says, I want you, you know, I know you can fabricate. I know you know the paint guys. I know you can yeah. do this and that. You know, you seem like a, a pretty handy bloke. I want you to do this. I might take it on as a job. You know what I mean? I might yeah. build you a fence if you pay me enough money or a raw sure. iron gate or what have you. Sure. A piece of art, you know what I mean? But um, do you like my um, deer antler lampshade, by the way? Yeah, no, no. I, I'll just go. Right? talking uh, about how many pieces of art. Yeah. But um, the... Um, but the problem is, I have a very hard time getting creative on that. So you would have to yeah. bring me your piece of shit design and tell me exactly what you want. You know, don't ask me to choose what brake lever you want or what color the headlight rim needs to be because I don't like your bike. So I can't make that decision yeah. because I'm just not interested, mate. Sure. I, I, yeah. I can do it and I can do a beautiful job of it. If you tell me exactly how everything needs to be, sure. because I can't be part of the decision making process and I need to be able to say, well, I just gave the guy exactly what he asked for and he paid me a lot of money to do it. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, I mean, I have, I have my reputation. Thing. I'd like to say, no, no way, I'm never going to do it. And that would have been the answer 10 or 15 years ago, of course. Um, 
But, you know, in reality, sure. we all got to make a living. So, um, you know, I, I could be paid to do something that I'm not keen on, but you'd have to tell me exactly what it is because I wouldn't yeah. be creative. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I can see that as well because you haven't, if you haven't got the, the, um, the love of doing it, then you're never going to have that, as you say, that creative spark to, you know, put your heart and mind into it. So I can, you know, I can, every, it's almost like you'd be painting by numbers, really, wouldn't you? You'd be like, okay, no, that's what you want. Okay, fine, I'll, I'll build it for you. But let's face it, if if your heart's not in it, you know. That, that's it. I get that people people keep saying, oh, you know, well, why don't you reinvent yourself? Why don't you? Why don't you do these baggers? Why don't you do this? You know, you know. I'm you know, always moaning times are hard and can't yeah. pay the bills, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, every time I even sort of think about it, it's like, this is what I like. I, I haven't got yeah. the brain cells that will tell, take me down a side alley yeah. to to even, you know, come up with some, you know, clever business. I mean, I'm just as likely to invent a, you know, electric toothbrush or a, you know, a... yeah motorized window shade or you, you know, I can't even, you know, I can't really come up with anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, As yeah. I am something for a bike that I'm not interested in, you know, I'm only into yeah. bikes because I really love the way the bikes I build. Look, that is yeah. why I'm here because I like the way my bikes look and because I'm not a git, my bikes have to go down the road. I I am totally yeah. anti half the stuff in the in these AMD shows. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but, you know, bikes for art's sake, you know that that brass Meccano bolt would snap off the minute yeah, yeah. you went round your first left-hand bend, but the bike yeah. looks really cool, and the guy spent 400 years hammering it out in a shed in Russia. I don't give a crap. If your bike doesn't go down the road, it isn't Absolutely. a fucking bike. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and you know, get out a custom bike scene or at least label your show something else, you know, yeah. motorcycle shaped sculpture event. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? if it's a, yeah. If it's motorcycle art, motorcycle sculpture, fine, do whatever you want. Yeah, but, do whatever you want, yeah. but don't, but don't pretend it's a bike because yeah. it isn't. And then what's insulting is, you know, everybody who's maybe perhaps on the fringes or a little less educated in terms of how a motorcycle works they yeah. look at that and think, oh, man, that guy's so great. That's such a beautiful bike. They don't realize that it, it completely non-functional. Yeah. And then you get, and then you got the nerve to call them the world's, you know, the world bike building champion. Yeah. It says who? It says yeah. not me. You know what I mean? And if, yeah. you know, it's not me and people like me, who the hell is saying this? You know what I mean? A bunch yeah, of other bike, bike bike doctorists, you know what I mean? You know, that should be completely separate. Anyway, you got me off on a, on a last no, minute no. soapbox. I sneaked one in there right oh. at the last hurdle. But, but that, that is a that is oh. a big bugbear of mine. You know what I mean? I love building bikes and I love being in the industry, but I hate it when, you know, people, you know, you say, oh, what do you do? I build, oh, like those American chopper guys. Like, no, nothing like those guys. If yeah, they were yeah. good and if they had taste, then exactly like them. But yeah. in the meantime, no. Um, no. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's, and, it's and this whole, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's it's almost like this. It's hard to say, but it's it's almost like they're they're imposters in 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 custom bike building uh, or in motorcycle culture sometimes. And you just look at it and you go, "No, nah, come on, oh please, you, no, no, don't try and convince me that that is true because it isn't." Don't try and pull the wool over my eyes and say that is a great looking bike or that's you know whatever. Uh, and and I'm of the same opinion, you know. And you say you know you either, whatever your style is, at least first of all be true to that style. And if you're going to make a bike, make sure it is a bike and not some you know bloody fire engine Christmas tree type thing, whatever that you're going to try and 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 then forks that seem to go on for a mile down the road i mean seriously I, I i remember seeing um uh no who who was it built them i, I don't know somebody built them and i thought uh, that's great as long as you're just going two miles an hour uh, along a straight road but you try and turn that bloody thing there's no, you're not going to convince me that that you know handles you know and when they come well, on yeah, well, yeah i mean you say that not to cut you off well yeah. completely to cut you off but yeah. um 
Yeah, whilst I take your point, and there are cases where that is the case, you can't always judge. I mean, I've got a friend here, super, super guy. I've, I've run into him for years. He's got the longest front end you've ever seen. You know, yeah. the guy's got one of them stomas that he smokes his bloody cigar through. He's, he's uh, hardcore. And he rides this thing everywhere all the time. Um, I've got another buddy right down the road who's got some very wacky creation with – ridiculously long for it. You know, he flew that thing into Switzerland and rode it through the Alps and south of France. And you look at him like, on that thing? But but yeah. they but they can do. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm less about the eccentric bike building style that yeah. you know, may not be my cup of tea. I mean, I love Swedish choppers. Swede, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Real yeah. Swedish choppers. Yeah. Um, but I've never really been much into the long springers necessarily. Yeah. But at least, you know, some of those bikes, they actually ride. I'm more talking about the frail pieces of art that are, you know, braced together and, you know, leaf yeah. spring this and a, and a weird mechanism that does that. Yeah. Um, those, are, those, are, those are what I find irritating. And I think a big part of it is I'm just irritated that there are people out there that pay those guys yeah. a quarter of a million dollars to put two years into making this thing that isn't a bike, it is a piece of art. I mean, guess I'm jealous. I wish I had somebody paying yeah. me that kind of money to yeah, build yeah, something. Yeah. Um, but, you know. Well, just keep on doing what you're doing, mate. That's I'll do what I say. I'll keep do on doing best. what you're doing. And everybody, keep on buying your stuff and buying your parts. <laughs> yeah. that, that's what I say. Yeah, that's what I say. I Listen, say that too. <laughs> Russell, I've, I've got to, I've got to ask you before we go. I've got to, and I will ask you this, right? How is it that you, a, a, a boy from Frampton upon Seven or on Seven? Is it on Seven or upon Seven? Yeah, on, on, or on Seven, uh, Severn, as as uh, is it, is with the R in it. Um, how is it that you retained your accent uh, all these years? Because I would have thought you would have adopted the LA twang by now. But yeah, you're, not, it's, it's, you're still still the same. I, I just don't I just don't get it. Yeah, it's it's I think when I'm talking to English people, the English aspect of it does come back somewhat. Not you know, not from yeah. an affectation. I'm not trying to talk British no, no. to you, mate, no. but um it does to some level. Um but when I go back home, my, my mates all think I sound American. And when I'm over here, everybody thinks I sound completely British. But I was, yeah. um, you know, I was in my mid, late 20s when I first came over here. So it, it it's hard. You know, I think by then your accent's kind of set in stone. You know what I mean? I pick yeah, up, sure. You pick up Americanisms and I pronounce words the way that they're going to be understood in this country because this is where I function. Um, but, yeah, that whole West Country um who are twang um yeah. stays with you it's pretty set in the, yeah. you know, died in the wall as it were yeah it's interesting when i lived in the states uh many years ago now I, that's what i'd say i'd tell the, the exact same story actually you know you've got your accent now that's it you know you, you you're an adult so that's not going to change what does change is uh words that you use to describe similar things like in america like we say garage over here and you've got a gas station you know, so all, all you're saying is gas station over there, or uh, what was the other one? Um, cell phone, right? So you got a cell phone. Well, we just call them mobiles back then, was, yeah. you know. So I went and also I went into an office one day and I said, uh, Oh, yeah, uh, you got uh, somebody uh, rang for you. Uh, can you ring this number or something? And the guy was saying, What rang? Well, what does rang mean? And I said, Well, you know, he rang on the phone. He just rang you. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just it's we're speaking the same language, kind of, but just using different words, and that's what I would say, really. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think you're right. Um, you you kind of have to adopt the American pronunciation because yeah. they are rather obtuse when it comes to un trying to under. They don't like to think outside the bun. The Americans, yeah. they really don't. You know, I mean, they don't much get apart um, apart from. That my American audience out there, who I think oh, are no, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. watching this no, video, I'm not, I'm not brilliant. Trying to, I'm not trying to knock them. I'm, I'm not. No. I, am, I love Americans. I'm super grateful to this country. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, for, yeah. You know, for everything. I, I love living here. I am yeah. an American. I'm an American citizen yeah. now. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, right, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I am American, so I cannot be knocking. But they don't. Yeah. They don't. 
um, they don't do that lateral thinking the way we do. If I say, you know, they don't really get the English sense of humor. Sarcasm is a little tricky because it's often taken at face value rather yeah. than as an attempt at humor. And, yeah. you know, you, you say something, you're trying to be witty. They don't sort of think it through and figure out, well, hang on, what the hell did that guy? Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. The last time I was here, I had a piece of shit car. You know, no wonder yeah, he's yeah. saying that or whatever. So they don't. So you, you, if you want to communicate with them, you got to kind of do it on their playing field. I mean, right. you should you should hear me when I'm, you know, talking to one of them robo credit card things and they want your number so zero for you, yeah. you got to kind of put on a fake texas accent otherwise they have no idea what you're saying you know what i mean right. I, I remember a friend of mine came over from london and he wanted a glass of water and, she, oh. and he went he had steam coming out of his ears and eventually i, I could see him almost ready to smack this waitress he's uh, like water he wants water yeah. Yeah. He, he, they could not make the leap yeah. from water to water you yeah. know, uh, they just couldn't. Um, and, uh, you, you know, you realize that it's, it's frustrating at first, but, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you get the hang of it. And then, of yeah. course, it becomes second nature. And then all my friends yeah, are absolutely. making yeah. fun of me because I'm saying rank 66 and, you know, <laughs> what have you. Um, yeah. But there you go. There you go. Well, but anyway, well, anyway God, listen. God bless America. Well, absolutely. And, 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 and God bless Exile Cycles and Russell Mitchell. That's what I say. Can we all <laughs> Thank pray? You. Can we all Can we all pray? <laughs> I think I might need a bit of that. Oh, <laughs> uh, Russell, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. An absolute pleasure. Well, thank you, Alf. I had a lovely time. It saved uh, doing work, you know. Oh, <laughs> what well, else, and, oh, what I, I be doing? Oh, you, know that, I mean? you make me feel guilty now. No, 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 no. With your massive audience, I can I can only see my sales spiking later this week, and uh, I should be... Uh, <laughs> Well, Living the heyday again before this time next listen, month. I know listen, it. I, just know. I, I will get onto my TV producers, right? Who only pay me a pound per series. You oh, know, Lord. Right. <laughs> that's a pound. <laughs> that's a pound more than Discovery ever paid me. Yeah, no, we, we got a contract, right? They, they make us sign a contract at the start of filming, and to, to legitimise that contract, they're supposed to pay us a pound oh. you know, for each person who, who's involved in in the, in the program, right? But they never pay us a pound. <laughs> so oh, I make the cameraman give us a pound. Say, come on, give us your pound then. There you <laughs> it's go. A, it's a kitty, you know, to buy some beer. There you so go, yeah. Get Ridiculous. the coffee. <laughs> but anyway, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, talking to me. Uh, everybody, uh, go check out our XL Cycles. And if you've got any parts uh, you want to put on your bike, go and check them out because they're fantastic. And some of the bikes on there are absolutely brilliant. I'm a massive fan. I know lots of other people all over the world are a massive fan of your bikes. And uh, just the, I don't want to say simplicity, but the, just the classic minimal, minimal, I can't even say it, minimalism uh, that you said as well. Uh, I, I think are fantastic. Uh, you know, they, they're timeless bikes and timeless, uh, timeless custom bikes, I would say. So, uh, go check them out. And uh, you're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, are you? Or, or... Uh, t much less of Twitter. I, I don't even know whether my Instagram... Basically, what I do is every now and again, I'll put up a photo and a, you know, a witty comment on Instagram, yeah. and whatever I put on Instagram goes straight to Facebook. What I don't do really ever is get into the whole chit chat yeah. you know i'm old you're old you know how it is it really if you want to talk business you know my the phone number is on the website the phone number is on the instagram page yeah. the, the email is there i i just don't get in there to check all the chit chat so i get a lot of yeah stick from you know people like you know asking questions oh that's great mate how much would it cost to do that to my bike you know yeah, you've got, to, you've got to call the shop. You know what I mean. Yeah, but, but it, Instagram and Facebook, go check it out. Insta I like Instagram. I got to say yeah. because it's a, it's a beautiful way to sort of portray a portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. Of, and you know, I'm not going to send you. Well, not very often. I did uh, take um, I did post a pic of me eggy soldiers the other Sunday morning because it was so British and I, you know, right. so be beautifully presented. Even though I yeah. say so myself, but but I won't bore you with you know, every sandwich that I eat, it yeah. is all very bike related. There's, you know, I restrain myself on, you know, putting up photos of my lovely kids and what have you. There's a yeah. little bit of that, you know, and my doggy. Um, yeah. But it, I, I think it's pretty interesting stuff. And it's, it's easy Instagram. You can get a whole swoop of what this bloke or this person is about or this company is about. Yeah. Uh, 
in one sort of visit, if you see what I'm saying, whereas Facebook's yeah, yeah, a little yeah. more disjointed. It's a little chit chat about a subject, what have you. So, yeah. so I, I, I do like Instagram, although I'm, I'm pretty hopeless at putting stuff well, up there. You know, lucky you, if I you get and me up. both. I'm, I'm absolutely rubbish at it. I'm absolutely rubbish, and I'm the same. I, 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 I when I had my motorcycle magazine a few years ago. Uh, um, I, and I found that I was actually spending more time uh, on the social media side of it and just not being productive. So I just thought, you know what, I've got to stop this. So I said, I just, uh, it, stuff goes up onto the social media on the Instagram and the Twitter or whatever, but I, I don't really engage with it. You know, come on to this channel, fine, send me an email, give me a call. Absolutely, I'm exactly the same way. Yeah, but I don't, anyway. I don't, I don't have the time to get in. You know, you, it's yeah. easy to get sucked in. You can spend hours looking at what yeah. everybody else is doing, Absolutely. and it's not productive. No. At, at times, it's a little bit um, depressing in a way. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. There's Absolutely. all this cool shit going on out there that I haven't got time yeah, to be yeah. part of. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and I tell you what, I have noticed yeah. <laughs> again, getting onto an aside at the very last hurdle. But yeah. a lot of these businesses. You know, someone will contact me. Oh, I'll go look it up. And, you know, you put you Google them, and then their Facebook yeah. up. And but you'll notice, two or three years ago, they stopped posting anything. They all got gung ho about the social media thing. They all did the Facebook yeah. thing. They all put in two hours a day putting up a thing and chit chatting back and forth. And then, if, two or three years ago, they realized, man, this is way too much work for the payback. You need to just yeah. actually go and do the work that this company is supposed to be doing. And that—that's yeah. you know. That's what I try to do. Actually, Absolutely. get in there and do the bloody work. It's too easy to be distracted, and you can spend all day being distracted every day. And that is yeah. going to get you. Well, I, I like to think I'm ahead of my time, and I said this about five or six years ago. So you know, less time on social media, more time actually doing what you want to do. Uh, if it's building bikes or writing or whatever, you know, making cakes, whatever you want to do, do that. Get off social media. Oh, yep. but Instagram, I think it's really cool. But here's what you need to do. Come a bit closer. Come a bit closer. That's it. Show me those pearly whites. Ha, where oh, are they? Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it as well. Can you see me breakfast? There you go. That's Got it. spinach. That is your Instagram uh, picture now. Uh -uh. Yeah, pretty there much is. I, expect, I expect it is. <laughs> Brilliant. Have you ha Brilliant. Ha hacked in there and changed it for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I'm not going to put that up. But you can. You do it. I'll tell you what. They'd love it. <laughs> but I anyway, think, I, think, I think the Instagram still has the mohawk, you know. But um, you know, the yeah. uh, you know, the times of well, not the times of change. I'm going to go see my mum soon, so I got to keep the mohawk at bay when I go visit yeah. my mum. Otherwise, she won't let me in the house. Uh, <laughs> right. Anyway, listen, uh, Russell, absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Uh, everybody, please like, share, subscribe. Leave those comments below. Let us know what you think of this interview. We'll have all the questions and all the answers. Custom bike building, XL cycles, Russell Mitchell, <laughs> his bikes, his parts, his life. Let us know in the comments. And uh, catch you again. Check out the website, revelatoralf.com. Subscribe. I think I've already said that bell thing at the bottom. Do that. And, uh, well, there's only one thing left to say. I would usually say, oh, my Harley. But I can't say that. I'm going to say, oh, my custom. Russell, <laughs> can you say, oh, my custom. Oh, my custom. <laughs> oh, good man. Good man. And with that, we're out. Revelator out.